who has the best engine this year? Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull, or Alpine? They've all developed these engines to be the best they can within the rules, but each has taken a very slightly different approach. So which one is best? We've analyzed acceleration data from every race this season to see which comes out on top, and the order isn't what you'd expect. Honestly, when we pulled the data together, all of us here in the office were a little bit confused. And in this week's race, power matters a lot. Azerbaijan has lots of heavy acceleration zones and a really, really long straight. So let's get into it. Now we must explain first that these engines are really close this year. The rules look to have done their job with no clear front runner in terms of power, which for the past six or seven years hasn't been the case. Mercedes got it right with the new rules in 2014, nailing their turbo hybrid format straight off the bat, leaving everyone else to catch up. But they have caught up. We expect the majority of the teams to have somewhere around 1,050 horsepower available to them. And the difference between the best and the worst isn't more than about 15 horsepower. So really not a lot. With that said, the engines do differ. So let's break down the differences. So let's first talk about the Alpine which is really a Renault engine from last year with a few changes, mainly to allow it to run well on E10 fuel. We asked Scarbs to summarize what makes all these engines different. And my word, he knows his stuff. They've gone to a split turbo, they've changed their intercooler packaging, so they've gone very much towards what Ferrari and Mercedes have done, where you have a water to air intercooler mounted in front of the engine, and that is the direct route for the air from the turbocharger from the compressor on the front of the engine, going up into the plenum on top of the engine to go back into the combustion chamber, which means that you get slightly smaller side pods because you've only got a small water radio, not this massive air to air intercooler. So really, it's a small change in the packaging, but this year I've been impressed with that Alpine, and particularly with its engine. But you'll see that in the results we've found a bit later. When we talk about Mercedes this year, I mean, it's quite unusual since 2014, Mercedes has been the power unit from which everyone is compared. And that is because it has dominated every other power unit. It's been ahead on every aspect of technology and performance throughout this period. Uh, early part of this year, everyone seemed to be panicking that the Mercedes had produced a you know, Bricksworth had produced a down on power engine, an engine re that really wasn't where it should be in performance terms compared with its two key rivals in Ferrari and Honda. I think that was probably a little bit of distraction because of the chassis and the problems that all of the Mercedes power unit users were really having with their cars. It didn't show the performance of that power unit. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I, you know, I was saying this very much earlier in the year, that they hadn't had that power unit turned up to maximum with as much as it perhaps would normally be in a competitive year in order just to save some performance and duty cycle from, from the power unit. When you look at the data, you see, to be honest, the Mercedes is as good as anything else out there. But the main thing is that it's been reliable. The performance has been hidden by the chassis issues, but at times the McLaren and the Mercedes chassis have made good use of it. There are other changes this year, like going back to vertical inlet trumpets and moving the exhaust around in the rear of the car to gain a bit more performance. But these really warrant their own video. It's interesting that Scarbs thinks the Mercedes team have been running it gently. It seems they could be saving the engines for when they have a few more upgrades and a more competitive car. With a couple of years being weirdly strong and then the year after, with a rule clarification, the engines being almost useless, Ferrari is back to being at the front. Certainly for this season, I think we have finally seen Ferrari achieve the same performance um, as Mercedes in terms of separating them. I think, you know, it depends which measure you want to take. I don't think there is anything between them that you could really, um, you know, shake a stick at there. You know, the drivability versus the peak horsepower versus reliability, fuel consumption, all of those factors, they seem so close. A um, couple of things you notice on the Ferrari, again, you would have to question, first of all, um, is the traction down to the Ferrari chassis, but the car, the car has great drive out of corners, uh, which comes down largely to the drivability of the combustion engine, but also how the hybrid system deploys, um, but equally, you know, there's, there's chassis factors in there. And then again, on peak horsepower, the Ferrari seems to be, you know, absolutely there with all of its rivals. They didn't go to split turbocharger. I've, I've looked and I've looked and I've seen evidence that maybe suggested they did, but then maybe suggested they didn't. I think what they've done over the winter is play about with their intercooler packaging, which is something that's been quite interesting. And the Ferrari, for, since 2014, have had one of their intercoolers at least 
inside the V of the engine, which is a water to air intercooler, uh, which really kind of narrows the path. They've run a, a secondary air to air intercooler several times before. This year it looks different. Um, previously we've seen that Mezzo intercooler, that kind of machined aluminium box sat there. It looks different this year and it comes out of the V of the engine quite differently and then goes up into the plenums quite differently. And yes, we are talking about small tweaks in how the teams get the air in and out of the engine. But in Formula One now, it's all about getting maximum power from very little fuel. And when I say very little, I mean it. These engines are being run very, very lean when compared to a normal race car. The power of these engines largely comes from the combustion and you know you've got lots of things going on there you have the pre-chamber ignition you have omega bowl pistons you have miller cycle you've now got this kind of hcci style secondary ignition around the rim of the uh, the piston i'm sure ferrari have got a bit of all of that going on inside that engine which is really allowing the combustion engine to really put out the horsepower that you need then the honda or the red bull powertrains but we're going to call it the honda Changes to the power unit over the winter seem quite limited. They did their big update last year. They changed every aspect of the architecture of that engine from the, the physical architecture and how the cams were aligned and giving you the valve angle, how compact it was, um, the, the plenum. They even changed the bank spacing order as well. So at the moment, the way combustion works in Formula One engines, to recap very quickly, it doesn't just happen in the combustion chamber. There's a small chamber on the end of the spark plug that starts the ignition. The combustion starts in there. Fl jets of flames come out from the bottom of this spark plug chamber, which ignite a small bowl of um, fuel air mixture in the piston. But then you also get, as compression increases, spontaneous ignition around the kind of the squishy area of the piston, which also means you get a kind of secondary ignition, very good burning of the limited amount of fuel that you have in there. Honda have found that, and with that, you find performance, you find power. And as a result, last year, Honda really kind of closed that gap up to Mercedes, even if they did have you know, some reliability issues, perhaps less than we did see uh, with uh, Mercedes. Now we must mention that all of the teams will have this sort of stuff, but combined together differently depending on their engine, their fuel providers and so on. By the way, 69% of you wonderful lot are not subscribed to the channel. So if you've watched a few of our videos, please help us out and hit that button. So let's look at which one is best. We've had seven Grand Prix so far, and that is enough data to look at which engine is on top so far. But without the teams straight up showing us their power and torque curves, this is tough to know for sure. Of course, you could look at straight line speed, but this has far more to do with the drag on the car than extra horsepower. You could also look at how a car picks up off a corner, that initial acceleration. But this is affected by the type of corner, what deploy the engine is doing, or how much grip the chassis has. But there is a sweet spot. The advice I've always been given by, by data engineers and uh, engineers from teams is to look at the acceleration curve. And this really is just seeing how speed builds up over distance or time. And you can then you know, compare the traces. And there's, again, there's a few factors here that you need to account for. First of all, you need to make sure you're looking at equal laps. You know, if you look at race laps, it can be very variable because of tire condition, you know, traffic and what have you. Um, equally, if you're looking at the driver's best laps, which is probably the best way of looking at this, because that is like, you know, the ideal amount of acceleration and power that the engine is putting out through that acceleration curve. Um, you need to ignore the very first section uh, as the car comes out of a corner because you've got corner speed as a factor, you've got traction as a factor as well. And then as the, the curve starts to flatten out, drag then is starting to have the impact. So you don't want to look at the top edge of the curve. You're looking at the very steep early part of the curve. And that really tells you how much power the engine's putting out because there's a lot less difference in factors there. And if we assume all of the cars have a relatively equal weight within a few kilograms, then it's that section. And that really tells us what's going on with the engines. It's only at that point we can then start to understand you know, which cars have got engines that are working really well um, in terms of putting out power. We've done this, but using F1 Tempo, who use the GPS data from F1. Now, this is good for our sort of simple analysis, but not nearly as accurate as what the F1 teams use. So we've done a lot of averaging to try and get the fairest result from it, but it isn't perfect. So bear that in mind. So let's look at an example. Final corner onto the long straight in Barcelona. We've taken the Red Bull and the Ferrari's fastest laps in qualifying. 
And here is a good example of why you can't look at the beginning or the end of these traces. The Red Bull has marginally higher corner speed, but the Ferrari gets off the corner better. Then as drag starts to form a bigger part of the equation, the Red Bull pulls ahead. But crucially, you can look at how they accelerate once traction is no longer a factor. And looking here, the Red Bull has the better acceleration. Now, this may not be more raw power or torque either, just that this car is providing more power at this point in time. So a more drivable car could create less peak power, but still get away better from the corner. But really, that's what we're on about with who has the best engine. In this moment, I would say I would rather have the Red Bull engine. So we did this for a couple of corners on each track this year, taking the fastest driver in each car in qualifying for each of the Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari and Alpine Motors to see which one comes out on top. So sometimes Russell was the quickest car with a Merck engine, but other times it was Lando. We've taken each fastest time. After ranking them one to four, with one being best, we can then take an average. That puts Honda as best, with Ferrari very close behind. Then Alpine actually beats the Mercedes. And that's a shock, but really it comes down to one race, Miami. Here, it looks like Alpine actually turned up their engine because they were the quickest of anyone in the acceleration zones, meaning that one race helped the average to be better than the Mercedes. You'll have lots of people that will tell you that there is an X, you know, an X horsepower difference, you know, 10, 20, 30. I think you know, you're talking about very, very small margins here. And, you know, if you could round out every factor and try to score it, I think each of these engines would come out almost exactly the same. I think if you swap them between cars, I don't think you would see a huge performance difference, which I think is great for Formula One. So as Scarb says, the difference isn't huge, but it is there. And if it's going to matter anywhere, it will matter in Baku this weekend. So let's see if that's how it turns out. You should check out this video on why Daniel Ricciardo was fast at Red Bull, but isn't as fast at McLaren. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.